My beloved brothers and sisters, coming to the stand and speaking to you is not a new experience. This is the 22nd time I've climbed up here in the last 10 and a half years. I'm not a stranger to you. Many of you know me. Some of you may be too well. But uh, this call has uh, set up a tremendous emotional reaction in me. I suppose the emotional strain is so great in large part because of the great respect I've always had for the office to which I'm now called. Men who held these offices were godlike men in the eyes of my parents. And when they used to come to old Mexico when I was a little child, I used to think they were of a different race almost. I've always thought of this office as the office of a special witness of the redeemer of the world. Marion George Romney was born on September the 19th, 1897, in Colonia Juarez, Mexico, a small Latter-day Saint community. He was the second of 10 children born to George S. Romney and Artemisia Red Romney. I remember that father began immediately to hold the monthly, it was at that time, yes. home evening. And that, uh, that was a time when we uh, uh, had some recreation in the home some making of uh, molasses candy and uh, popcorn balls and putting on little uh, uh, shows with the children taking uh, uh, part. And uh, those memories are some of the most enjoyable that I have. Life in Mexico came to an abrupt end for him and his family and most of the Mormon colonists in 1912. The Madero Revolution was underway and the poorly equipped rebel forces took from the Mormons whatever they felt they needed. The men decided to send all the women and children back to the United States for safety, with the expectation that they would return when things settled down. But the Romney family never went back to Mexico. George Romney and his brother Gaskell were carpenters and they found jobs in El Paso. Later, the two families relocated in California. President Romney said of his time, it was there I began to learn the carpenter trade. I worked with my father and uncle as a carpenter's helper. I did carpenter work off and on from then until I started to study law, some 15 years. The Romneys decided they did not want to raise their families in Los Angeles, so they moved to Oakley, Idaho but it proved to be very hard to make a living. After three years of struggle, the family moved to Salt Lake City, Utah, where Marion's father took a job as custodian while attending the University of Utah. In the spring of 1917, his father received his degree, and that fall, the family moved to Rexburg, Idaho, where George S. Romney became president of Rick's Academy. Marion finished high school at Rick's Academy in 1918, graduating as valedictorian of his class. That fall, he met his future wife, Ida Jensen of Idaho Falls. Marion and Ida courted while he attended Rick's Normal College. In 1920, he graduated with an associate degree and planned that fall to continue his education at the University of Idaho. Late in the summer, he attended Stake Conference where Apostle Melvin J. Ballard related missionary experiences. Touched by the Spirit, he left that fall to Australia on a mission. In January 1924, he enrolled at BYU where he attended for two quarters. Then he worked another summer in Salt Lake City and on September the 12th, 1924, he married his longtime sweetheart, Ida Jensen. 
They became the parents of four children, two of whom died shortly after birth. After graduation from the University of Utah in 1926, he started law school. He had switched from engineering to law because he could not work and manage the laboratory sessions required in engineering. He practiced law in Salt Lake City for 12 years and enjoyed a distinct reputation for honesty and uprightness. In 1935, he became bishop of the 33rd Ward in Salt Lake. The welfare program of the church was introduced and he gathered up clothing and food to care for his ward members. In 1938, he was called to be president of the Bonneville Stake. While serving in this capacity, Marion G. Romney was called to be an assistant to the Council of the Twelve. The same day, his friend, Harold B. Lee, became an apostle. I'm grateful for my own family and their support of me. My sons and daughter-in-law, my 16-month-old granddaughter that gives me lots of joy. And last but not least, my beloved companion, the sweetheart of my youth and the mother of my children. They've never put a straw in my way. We had been married 17 years when I came into this assistance and I'd only been away from home, left I the home alone two nights. When I first started around the church, it was kind of hard. She used to cry every time I left and every time I came back. Now she only cries when I come back. <laughs> Soon after his new calling as an assistant to the Twelve, he was asked to serve as assistant managing director of the new church welfare program. It has been my desire today, brothers and sisters, to refocus our attention on the basic fundamental principles of the welfare services. I reiterate that welfare services is not just a program. It is the gospel in action. Its principles are the principles of the gospel. It is the Christian rule in temporal affairs. It is my desire that we learn from the scriptures and from the counsel of the living prophets and do our part to sustain ourselves, to care for our families, and with generosity and humility contribute our share to maintaining those less fortunate than we. During those years as assistant managing director of the church welfare program, he crisscrossed the church visiting stakes, counseling with them about the new program, and helping them set up welfare production projects. When he began his ministry, there were 41 welfare farms. After 10 and one half years, there were 541 farms and production units, making everything from milk to spaghetti. On October 6, 1951, Marion G. Romney was called to be an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ and sustained by the General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints assembled in the tabernacle on Temple Square. He was 54 years old and had already served as bishop, a stake president, and as an assistant to the Quorum of the Twelve. Now he would be a special witness to the world that Jesus Christ is the Redeemer of all mankind. Now I am very grateful to you, my brothers and sisters. I love every one of you. I love you for what you've done for me. Receive me into your homes. I'll do everything I can to serve you, and I'll do everything I can to honor this high calling. God bless you, and God bless me, and will you pray for me that no enemy shall dent the small sector of the line that I'm assigned to defend, I pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The people came to love him for his quick wit and delightful turn of a phrase. They found his sense of humor to be a source of endearment. And I love Brother Joseph Fielding. He's been awfully good to me. I thought he treated me especially good till I got talking to the brother and found out he treated them all the same. 
Now, I love all the brethren, every one of them. I won't go down through the 12, except to mention Brother Lee and Brother Moyle. Brother Lee's a seer. They're my closest associates. I know I'll never go wrong up and with him, and I know I'll never go hungry if I'm with Brother Moyle, because he's a liberal. Throughout his years of service as a general authority, he has given guidance and direction to many of the programs of the church. In 1960, he was appointed mission supervisor of the missions in Central America and Mexico, including two Spanish-speaking missions in the United States. He helped supervise the extension of the gospel teaching to nations of the world. In 1972, Marion G. Romney was called to be second counselor to President Harold B. Lee and served with N. Eldon Tanner in the first presidency. In 1973, when Spencer W. Kimball became president of the church, President Romney was again a member of the first presidency with President Tanner. I have had association with the general authorities now for about 40 years as a member of the church. And I've enjoyed my labors very much. I can bear witness to the to the righteousness of the men with whom I've labored. It's a great thing to labor with men like President Kimball and President Tanner. They are men without guile. They are men who do Herculean tasks, who labor far beyond their normal strength and are held up and prospered by the power of the Lord that rests upon them. And I am grateful for my opportunity to labor with them. He sustained President Kimball's efforts in missionary work and temple building and participated in the dedication of many temples. We're here to mark the completion of the erection of this magnificent temple. A temple is not an ordinary meeting house. A temple is the house of God. It belongs to God. It's his dwelling place. From the earliest times, people who have known the true and living God have builded houses to him. It's a place where God reveals his presence to his faithful saints. In December 1982, President Romney became first counselor to President Kimball after the death of President Tanner. President Gordon B. Hinckley was called a second counselor. As President Kimball said, we have come to realize that the making of a Marion G. Romney was not the effort of a few decades, but it has been an eternal thing, bringing together all the great qualities and opportunities, tests, privileges, challenges, and times into a whole to prepare him for the opportunities he now has. The name of Christ and his gospel is not merely mentioned, but is plowed deep in his consciousness. Now, my brother, and I want to leave with you my witness. I know that God lives, and I'm striving with all my soul to know God himself. I do not remember the time when I had any question about the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know as I live that Jesus lives, that he was and is the only begotten Son of God in the flesh, and that he is our Redeemer. And I bear you this testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.